Hi, this is Phil Parker, and what I'd like to do is talk about the very first step of the strategic planning process when you're going to be engaging in teams or leading teams in the field of machine learning and artificial intelligence. Now, this is really odd. Why would you actually start with the idea of knowing what you want? Don't all businesses basically want the same thing? Well, it turns out there's a little bit of subtlety there, especially since there's a disconnect between what development teams and people in the profession might prioritize versus business leaders. So the idea is to bridge the gap between the two. We're going to start with the business side of things. Now, knowing that people in IT and information technology or in machine learning, they will actually use very similar words. For example, build to purpose. Purpose is your objective. So what in the world do you want? Let's, very, let's start uh, with a very simple, uh, broad brush view of business objectives. I've come over the years to believe that there's two broad schools of thought. Now I'm adapting a, a thinking process that came from macroeconomics where you had the freshwater school of thought and the saltwater school of thought. Let's start with the freshwater school of thought. These are uh, basically the thought process from people near the Great Lakes of the United States. Because they're near lakes, we'll call it freshwater. Now, this is a very politically correct view of the business objective. Uh, how many of you guys out there, how many of you want to help needy people? Okay, pretty much everyone wants to help needy people. If you want to help needy people, you will love this first objective of a business. Um, it was very much popularized after uh, Peter Drucker and others started talking about management by objectives. Okay, freshwater school of thought. The goal of this school is to serve customer needs. Needs, there's needy people out there, but there's a trick. Serve customer needs more effectively than competitors. In essence, we're all fighting to serve these needy customers. However, you want to do so in the long run. You wanna be around a long time. Therefore, you have to have cash flow and profit. In other words, to this school of thought, Profit and cash flow is an artifact of an overarching objective to serve customer needs. Because we're serving needy people, it's considered politically correct. And you'll often see this written in textbooks from authors uh, who originated this school of thought from the University of Chicago, perhaps Northwestern University, amongst other places. All right, let's draw the needs curve. You might remember this from your earliest courses in microeconomics. We've got the vertical axis being price and the horizontal axis being quantity demanded. And we have this downward sloping curve. Let's call that the needs curve. Suppose we have a price in the middle there, just in the middle, some average price that gives us some average quality. Further, assume, let's just assume that we have a movie theater. A movie theater has very low marginal cost, very low cost per person coming to the movie theater. At that one price, Question, have we served all the needs of the market? No, needs are plural. There are people who are not going to attend the movie. Now, who are those people? People who cannot afford that price. Therefore, should the movie theater actually offer a price that will attract those other customers? Who are they? Hmm, low income, probably students and grandmothers, right? Do we want to serve grandma? Sure we do. So we're going to drop the price and offer a senior citizen's discount or a student discount. Now we're selling more movie theater tickets. You'll also know, notice along this needs or demand curve that we've got this segment, this hormonally driven segment that wants us to keep the movie theater open late at night on Saturdays and Friday nights. Maybe we should offer a product to them as well. So let's have a high price, low quantity um, of people going very, very late at night to the movies, the hormonally driven segment. Okay, perfect. Now, what is this called? When you offer exactly the same thing to different groups of people in machine learning, we would call those clusters. In marketing, we call them segments. What is it to charge different prices to different people for the same thing? That's called price discrimination. No one in business typically says, hey, I've got an idea, let's do price discrimination. It just doesn't sound very good. So what we use in the world of business is we say segmentation, serving customer segment needs more effectively than competitors. Now in the world of machine learning, we use a lot of different algorithms to help us make the decision as to who to sell who at which price point. Now the tools that have been used in machine learning for this exact purpose, figuring out how much someone is willing to pay along that demand curve, we could end up using factor analysis, we could use cluster analysis, and maybe conjoint analysis to help us make that decision. 
Let's take an example of a company called the Accor Group. They have a hotel called the Mercure. The Mercure, let's say, is right there in the middle at that first P and Q point. Okay, great. Have all the needs been fulfilled by that one product? No. There's people willing to pay more. Let's call that Sofitel. And then Chateau's Sofitel de Mer. Go down the demand curve and we might have, oh, I don't know, Novotel, Ibis, and then Formula One. Going all the way down the demand curve where people basically check themselves in. There is no labor. Now, what's interesting here is the more you go towards the bottom of the demand curve, or what some people might call the bottom of the pyramid, all of a sudden you see a lot of optimization going on in the world of AI. In other words, let's replace human labor, labor with either the labor of the consumer or perhaps algorithms. The more we have algorithms to reduce our costs, the lower the price we can actually charge to customers. So you often see at the other end of the demand curve, a high use of labor, the services industry, but even now today, and we can talk about that later, you can see that even in services industries, you're seeing a lot of automation and algorithms. Okay, that's the first school of thought. Very simple, know your customer, be customer centric, do a lot of research, and then serve the customer needs. Now, there is a second school of thought. And you don't see this written up very much in textbooks because it's not very politically correct. Not at all PC. You'll see this based on the algorithms developed by schools like the Wharton School, MIT, maybe NCAD, London Business School, etc. Coming up with methodologies that are, that are a little bit out of the box. It's not about researching the demand curve. So let me paraphrase this second school of thought. Basically, not near the Great Lakes, more towards the oceans. In this second school of thought, the objective is make the customer pay as much as you possibly can, however, but without them complaining. In other words, the objective is not to rip anyone off. The objective is to charge as much as you can, but without them complaining. Now in strategy, we would say the word switching. In telecommunication, we might use the word churning without them leaving our network, for example. So in this school of thought, they see the first school of thought is mediocrity. If you just research the demand curve, anybody could do that. To the second school of thought, the world is nothing more than an income distribution problem. You folks have income, I want to distribute it to me. That's it. It's an income distribution. I've got a hose, huge hose. I stick it down your pocket. I suck the last dime out of you. And what do you say at the end of it? Aha, that was pretty good. Thanks a lot. In other words, they're not complaining. I'm not ripping people off. So if we compare it to the first school of thought, you don't research the demand curve. You pivot the demand curve. You create the demand curve. And if you can, you make it go vertical. True gurus can pivot demand curves total guru action. These are the people who get the bonuses, etc. There was a great cartoonist, Gary Larson, who had this wonderful cartoon of a man standing in his living room. He's holding a brick. Someone has thrown a brick through the window. There's glass all over the floor and attached to the brick is a note. Do you need your window repaired? Call 555-1279. That is the second school of thought. You're pivoting the demand curve. For all the CEOs out there, you've ever heard of the McKinsey Quarterly? The article titles are something like, have you heard the effect of disintermediation in hyper-fragmented, artificially intelligent market segments? No, call us at 555 The McKinsey Quarterly is a brick being thrown through the window of, C of the C-suite. Okay, two broad schools of thought. The truth is, if you can't do the first school of thought, the minimum, know your customer, segment the market, you're probably not that sophisticated in the first place. You can't do that. Is it sufficient just to do that? No. You actually need to learn about the second school of thought because there are people who are actually enacting it. And if you're not ready to compete against firms that are strong on the second school of thought, you might end up finding yourself behind the curve. Okay. How many of you have ever gone to a board meeting where someone says, hey, there's two schools of thought in terms of our objectives? Nobody. Nobody says that. Instead, what do people actually say? That's what we're going to next. Okay, in a typical discussion, what you're going to find is different people within an organization will say different things about their objectives. For example, 
in a family business where people want their children's children's children to continue to operate the business, the CEO may stand up and say, our goal is survival. We just want to survive in the long run forever. Well, if that's true, then what kind of prices do these companies typically have if you had to average them across, let's say, pure Wall Street companies? Well, the truth is their prices are actually a bit lower than a fully competitive firm, low prices. And what kind of overheads do they have? Well, they tend to have a lot of family members and a lot of, a lot of overhead, meaning they have a lot of a high cost structure, which means their profitability is often lower than compared to the same firm had they been run by private equity investors. So that's why private equity investors love taking over family businesses. They buy the company, fire the cousins, jack up the price, and then flip the, flip the firm to someone else. So family businesses give us low prices, high cost structures. But what if someone says, well, my goal is to maximize my revenues. That's what I really want to do. What, what happens that? When you maximize revenues, if someone says, hey, by the end of the year, we need to double our revenues. Well, what that leads to typically is an increase of the price of the products to the loyal customers. Now, and what does that do to the cost structure? It actually increased. What kind of costs go up? Marketing costs. Marketing costs go up. So we're looking at differences in arrows across these two objectives. I say survival, arrows in one direction. I say maximize revenue, arrows in another direction. What about maximizing your unit sales growth? You. What does that lead to? Well, that means I want a lot of eyeballs on my website. I just want units sold, for example. I want to buy market share, so to speak. Well, that leads to a low price and a high cost structure. What's the cost that will be incurred? Well, of, of course, like marketing costs. Again, the arrows are in different directions. What if I want to maximize current pro profits? This quarter's profits, just this quarter. What's the first thing you do? You jack up the price on the loyal customers again. But this time, you cut costs. Coronavirus breaks out. We got to get profits really quickly. What's the first thing to be cut when you get a recession? INSEAD is. Business schools. Those are the first things you spend less money on. And then you cut other things after that, non-essential expenditures. You'll notice again, the arrows are in different directions. I change slightly the wording and the arrows change directions. Now, if you've ever worked in an organization where someone says, we want to survive, we want to maximize short run profits, we want to have long run revenues go up, and we want high unit growth rates. Okay, good luck. Nobody knows what to do. So when there's confusion, often you'll have someone in the C-suite, perhaps the CFO say, look, shareholders expect a certain percent growth from us, okay? So I'm going to give you a percent target, 17% something. It could be EBITDA margins, it could be growth rate, whatever. It's a percent. A percent. Well, when you give someone a percent, that can lead to one or two things. The first thing it can do is it can lead to you leaving money on the table. What do I mean by that? If you tell people to do 17% and they can achieve 40%, chances are they're only going to achieve 17%. Why? Because they're going to think you're going to try to do the same thing in the following year. So they want to leave a buffer. Now, if it doesn't lead to your company leaving money on the table, the opposite can take place. And that's what? Smart people in your company quit. The dumb people will stay and your firm becomes an idiot. How so? Suppose you told people 17%, but the, in reality, the best the firm can do is 10%. Well, if that's true, if the best you can do is 10% and salespeople, for example, are compensated based on sales, that's their incentive plan, what salesperson is going to wait a full year to find out they don't make their targets? They're not going to do it. They are going to quit. They're going to go somewhere else that has more realistic objectives. If the smart people quit, who's left over? The dum-dums, right? So you'll end up having a, an organization which is frankly fairly mediocre. So percents generally are not considered the best targets in the world to have. So across all of these different objectives that you've just seen, a little trick is when someone says we want to maximize revenue, just say why, or we want to maximize market share. Just ask why we want to have uh, a survival. Why, 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 why? And ultimately, if you play the why, why game long enough with an executive, what they will say is, well, the reason we want to do that is because we believe it maximizes shareholder value. This is the four star winning way of pleasing the C-suite shareholder value question. Should the price be high 
or the price be low. That's not clear. You price it too high, you don't make any money. You price it too low, you don't make any money. It's an optimization or control problem, which means what? It's expensive to solve it. Why? Because you need to do a lot of research. A lot of firms don't have the patience, the skills, or the money to pay for a research. So what, they, what do they do? They typically look for proxies. They go to the airport bookstore, they buy the guru book, typically with some person on the back with a very fancy name, maybe wearing a turban, telling people, this is what you need to do. You need to maximize your market share. You need to make the customers happy. You need to energize your local internal entrepreneurship. They'll come up with some guru advice and they will follow that advice thinking it will maximize shareholder value. Other people will say, why are you talking about shareholders? I have stakeholders, I have labor unions, I've got a very complicated problem. And worse, someone's gonna say, I don't have anything to do with money, my objective. My objective is actually to cure polio or to cure malaria or something like that. If you are in an organization, the very first thing you need to do is not make pass judgment on these objectives. It's just to write them on a piece of paper. What is exactly your target? That will have an implication on what kind of methodology you use to go to market. Literally, some algorithms can cost tens of millions of dollars for you to develop. In other cases, you can get something off the shelf, right off of GitHub, and you can run it immediately, and that will change fundamentally how quickly things can be achieved. So we need to have some notion of speed, return, uh, turnover, KPIs, all of those kinds of financial and social objectives need to be put on the table. Of all the ones I've just listed, one of them in particular is bothersome for most people at the C-suite. Of all of those, the hardest to solve is typically shareholder value. So what we're gonna do is spend a few minutes talking about this shareholder value equation. Now, I have finance colleagues who will often talk about shareholder value and they'll talk about, about the returns to capital, the cost to capital, wax, NPVs, these kinds of things. Nobody in the C-suite who's doing strategy thinks about wax and all those kinds of ratios, financial ratios. Rather, in the back of their minds, they all have one equation. Your typical marketing manager, your typical CEO, board member has one equation in the back of their minds. So I want you to go back to high school now. This is gonna hurt a little bit, so get ready. We're gonna talk about this famous profit equation. All right, pi is the symbol I use for profit. So we wanna maximize profit. We wanna, we wanna make that go as, as high as we can. So it's basically uh, a machine learning control type of problem. So this equals, this profit equals the three sigmas. What's the first sigma? The first sigma is I have to decide which countries I want to compete in or regions I might wanna compete in. Let's call that the first sigma. The second sigma, just because I've decided to go into China doesn't mean I sell to everybody in China. I have to decide which segments of people I want to target. Maybe I wanna go for teenagers. Maybe I wanna go for grandparents. Maybe I wanna to go to OEM manufacturers, whatever, but those are segments. And I might choose you know, four, four to 10 segments I might wanna target. Just because I target teenagers doesn't mean I sell everything to them. I have to decide what are the products or services that I wanna offer those segments. And so I have segments. Those sigma, sigma, sigma. Geography, segment, and products. This is called the portfolio. From that portfolio, I have to get some cash flows. Now, we in, uh, in, uh, in business are often have a sense of insecurity, especially in strategy or marketing or organizational behavior vis-a-vis -vis the finance professors. Now, they would talk about discounted cash flows by maybe having a sigma, one plus R to the T, or something like that. But we're, we're a bit more sophisticated, right, than these finance guys. So we'll put an integral sign here. So real-time discounting, 24 hours a day. If you remember from high school, integral, we're summing up in real time, just like the sigmas, but continually summing up uh, cash flows. Cash flows from, from today, point, point zero, up to time period T. T is my time horizon. Could be one year, two years, five years, 10 years, time horizon. That's something we're gonna have to talk about. Then we have to discount them. If you remember the logarithm curve, the opposite of the logarithm curve is the exponential function. So E to the minus RT. R is my 
discount rate. Now, if you're not really sure what that discount rate is, just put 10.23 to make it look like you've calculated it, but it could be anything. Just call the finance guys and ask them what their discount rate is. All right, now we're going to discount cash flows. What's cash flows? Well, we have a product, so it has a price minus its marginal cost. That's the incremental cost of manufacturing it or, or providing it to the customer, right? P minus MC, that's my margin, right? That margin is then multiplied by the units that I sell. That combined gives me my gross profits. But away from gross profits, I have to subtract something. I have to subtract, for example, people like you. You're the fixed cost structure. Unless you're a consultant, then you're part of the marginal cost because it's your labor, right, going into the product. But for just about everybody else, the fixed cost is all the overheads, things not involved in the cost of goods sold. And then for the French out there, I'm gonna close this integral with a little DT symbol to let us know where it ends. There it is, that is shareholder value. I believe CEOs should have this tattooed on their foreheads backwards so they never forget what the objective of the day is, especially those that are traded on Wall Street. Why? Because they literally are being hired to maximize that equation. That is their fundamental problem. Now, my brother Jay is this anesthesiologist and he's always telling me about how he saves everybody's lives. Phil, I save lives. You know, people are bleeding and I stop them bleeding and all that. He goes, what do you do in business, man? You just don't add value, man. How can you talk so long about business? Business is trivial. Uh, how so? Well, you've got to sell to somebody, somewhere, something. And that's the portfolio. And you got to buy low, sell high, but don't spend too much money doing it. Mm, yep, that's pretty much it, actually. Now, if that was the only thing we had to worry about, what would be the optimal price, you would say? Well, infinite, because at a very, very high price, pi profit goes up. So infinite price, what's the optimal marginal cost? Well, that obviously would be zero. No cost is good. And what's the optimal fixed cost? Zero. Selling oxygen to everyone everywhere at an infinite price is a killer business model. The only problem, of course, is that there's interaction between these terms. As you jack your price up, your units fall. You know, as you expand internationally, your fixed costs go up. And as, hopefully as your fixed costs go up, you actually sell more units because you've got more salespeople selling things. As you sell more units, your marginal costs might go down because there might be economies of scale, etc. These variables interact with each other. So the tricky part about business is those interaction effects. When we're doing supervised machine learning on this control maximization problem, it's the, the constraints and understanding them that, that becomes the money issue, right? If I don't know the constraints, I'm gonna have a bad solution to that equation. So fortunately in business, we, we have three killer equations. The first equation, what are units a function of? Well, traditionally in business schools, we teach that the units are a function of something. There's an equation there. It's a function of marketing. Well, what, what is marketing exactly? Well, a lot of people talk about the four P's of marketing. What's the first P? That's the product or product quality. Great. What's the second P? Well, we have to price the product. Okay. What's the third P? We have to promote or communicate. Most people think marketing is about advertising. So that's where this would go. Promotion, communications. What's the fourth P? Uh, that's place. We have to distribute the product, right? We have to, we have to make sure it's sold throughout. So some people say sales and marketing. The, the sales part is this distribution. Make sure it gets out to the masses. But is that the only thing that drives unit sales? No, there's a lot of things that drive unit sales. How about what the competitors are doing? How about their prices, their quality, everything competition do? What about regulators? Can regulators affect the units we sell? You know, if they impose a lockdown or something, yeah, that, that could have a big effect on my unit sales. What if a meteorite slams into Paris and flattens Paris? Could that affect the units sold by a cafe, uh, croissants and things? Sure. So how many things can go into this equation? An infinite number. In fact, nobody even knows this equation. And that's why we have business schools. If all of us knew that equation, nobody would actually be running business. The entire world would be run by one robot or an algorithm. There's high uncertainty that equation. What drives sales? That's a mystery. Can algorithms help me understand that equation? Absolutely. And that's what a lot of people are investing their time in. What's the second equation? Marginal cost. Now, way back when, in the 1960s and 70s, there was something called the BCG curve. McKinsey, of course, got a little upset by that and relabeled it the learning curve or the experience curve, depending on if it's labor-based or you know, production-based. And they, they basically said, the more you've produced historically, the lower your marginal cost structure. Okay, so historical volumes explain 
marginal cost. But is that all there is? No, maybe the raw materials that I'm using, maybe a little technology, maybe I can use algorithms to drive marginal cost to their absolute minimum. This is an area that I innovated in, in the publishing industry. How do you eliminate authors to create the next incremental book? Can I write algorithms for that? So a little bit of tech, raw materials, volume. What about the third equation? Fixed cost. Now, what is that a function of? Well, if I have a lot of offices around the world, they have to be staffed. I have a lot of IT. So the sigmas actually affect this. The technology. Can I create a company who's fully algorithmically run so there are no managers? Can I create algorithms to replace managers. And that was pioneered by John Little at MIT when he talked about cover story, what's the news and the data, where basically you don't need to have statisticians analyze data anymore. Just let an algorithm produce the result automatically and send it to the manager. So yeah, maybe a little tech could go into here and a bit of creativity. Creativity can go a long ways in driving our fixed cost structures down. Okay, there's the equation. Now, how many of you could go back to your office Put, it a, put this equation in a spreadsheet, crank it out and go beep, okay, I know I can run this entire company. Your job is to find the optimal price, product, quality, distribution, you know, sigma, 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 creativity, all of that. Is it possible at all for you to solve this problem? The answer is yes, because that's your job if you're in a company where that's the objective, shareholder value. The only question is not whether you need to solve it or can solve it or not. The only question is, how do you solve it? How do you do this? The answer is, you're going to guess, but with style. Now, consulting firms will call style frameworks. In the world of AI or machine learning, we will say algorithms. So we will use algorithms to help us solve this equation. Now, here's the bad news. You know that most people don't like consulting firms. They, they despise them. They hate them. And there's a reason, because of the simple reason that everyone in a company has a time horizon T, and it's not always the same. Let's look at the very tip top of management. Who's at the top, top, top of management? Nobody's higher than them. Let's call them the shareholders. Do the shelter shareholders have time to solve this equation? No, they don't have it. So they outsource it to a board, the board members. They have time? No, nah, they don't have time. So they give it to a CEO. CEO, busy, busy CEO. Downloads it to who? To the CTO, the CFO, the CXY. The chiefs, chiefs, busy, busy. They're at Davos, you know, going to conferences. So they outsource it to who? The ESVPs, those guys, too busy. They're executives and senior and vice president. Oh my God, they can't have it. They can't fool with this thing. They download that problem to who? A senior vice president, and then to a vice president, then to finally a person called a manager. And who's at the bottom of this food chain? Who's at the very bottom of this? It's salespeople. Salespeople face this curve, these curves every single day, the unit curve, they're right there. Now, what is the average time horizon of a salesperson? You simply have to ask how often are their KPIs actually produced on a report? Weekly, daily, monthly, that's typically their horizon. So let's say one month. What about the Salesforce director? What is their time horizon? Well, that might be three, six months, maybe a year. What about the people above them that are deciding the product pipeline, R&D, things like that? It might be a year to three years, depending on the industry. What about the C-suite? What's their horizon? Well, it depends on when their stocks are vested. If it's vested in five years, bam, to the day, it is five years. What about the board members and those kind of people? Well, they're kind of in their late 60s, 70s, you know, their life expectancy is about 81 years. So we're talking about seven, five to seven years, right? That's what they're right. What about the, uh, the shareholders? Well, it depends. If they're a sovereign fund, they're actually hedging for the future of an entire economy, right? So it might be 10 to 20 years. So when they're looking at your company, they're willing to give you a quite a big time horizon. Now, that time horizon T is critical because you have to ask yourself, I'm going to develop some AI and machine learning stuff question, who am I developing it for? If it's for the objective of the salespeople, then I had better get results in quickly. I'm going to have to use someone else's code. I cannot create an original methodology to get things done. If, however, I'm doing something for the C-suite, well, they're a little bit more patient. So they might say, yeah, I'm going to give you three years maybe to deliver on some kind of new technology. Very important that you get that. Now, 80% of companies that we teach at INSEAD, the typical firm is schizophrenic. They will literally say, 
We want everybody to be strategic. Think long run, but every quarter you have to return your KPIs. And that's just life. That's just life. So often when you're doing development work, you have to show progress towards that three-year goal, maybe on a quarterly basis, which does affect the programming style of many, of many teams. For example, if your team is not given a very quick, short horizon, they will not use what's called RAD or rapid application development. They just won't do that. What they'll do is they'll spend a lot of time, maybe even hire a vendor to help them design a GUI, help them come up with the architecture of the network system. And that may take an eight week process just to nail what exactly we're looking to create here. Versus you walk into a team and say, I need a blue smoke version. That's my jargon uh, that I use mostly. You know, when you buy an old junked car, you turn the key and it just doesn't turn over. Something's wrong, right? So you want to create a blue smoke version. When you turn the key, maybe we change the battery, we swap out the spark plugs, uh, maybe change the oil, uh, do a little bit of uh, you know uh, tweaking here and there. And then when you turn the key, some blue smoke is coming out the back. At least it works. This is the technique I use with my development team. I typically say, look guys, by the end of the week, go out and look, find out some code, get something kind of like this working within one week. Let's just have a, let's just have a hackathon and just get something going. Why? I prefer that method rather than spending weeks and weeks designing things because once you do that one week episode, you'd kind of know where the uncertainties are what we're going to have to figure out how to do. And frankly, it's just a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun engaging with people when you have a one week deadline. Sometimes we'll actually reduce it to even shorter, maybe a couple of days. Okay. So that is the equation. Now, very few people that I've ever met would dare show this equation in a boardroom meeting saying, Hey, we're here on behalf of the shareholders. This is what they want. Everybody will freak out with all the symbols, you know, the sigmas and the integrals and stuff. You know, it's just overkill, overkill. So what do firms typically actually say? What, what, what do they talk about, when, especially when they do it in a public way? Typically, we talk about aspirations. Very, very good word, aspirations. What are we trying to achieve? Again, IT people will say, build to purpose. What's the purpose of this application, of this algorithm? What are, what are you aspiring to achieve? Now, in many cases, this is a mission and vision statement. These words come largely from a military uh, uh, heritage of sorts. What is the platoon's mission? Well, so what is a mission? It's basically you need to do the following. That's your mission. If you remember the old World War II movies where you have the squadron of the Spitfire squadron and then the, the captain comes up and says, okay, okay, man, here is... Uh, here is your mission. Fly over this region, defend us, etc., etc. And the curtain closes and they fly off. That is a mission statement. It's a constraint. It doesn't say go fly. It says, no, fly particularly to this area right there. That is a mission. Can missions change once in a while? Yes, they can change from once in a while. So typically you'll look on a website and they'll have something called a mission statement. This should never be drafted by a communications department. It should be drafted by the strategic planners of the organization because a well-crafted mission is a wonderful thing to have. It can be very motivating, but more importantly to AI and machine learning, it gives you a constraint on what's possible. For example, let's say INSEAD's mission is to educate the world's business leaders. Okay, let's say that. Now, just think about it. Educate the world's business leaders. Does that look familiar to anyone here? Educate world's business. Oh yeah, that's the sigma, sigma, sigma. Educate world's business leaders. There it is, the three sigmas. So the mission statement tells us we're not going to make a lot of money selling toothpaste. We're not going to make a lot of money selling t-shirts. We're educating the world's business leaders. Does it say past leaders, future leaders, current leaders? It doesn't say anything. It just says leaders, which means what? Maybe we can actually offer programs to people who are future leaders, not existing leaders. Uh, it says world. Well, who's in the world? Where there's English speaking world, there's the non-English speaking world. There's the rich world, the poor world. Do we constrained to only one part of it? No, we're not constrained. Hence, the dean at the time allowed me to work the, with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, creating algorithms to produce content 
for people in villages, etc. So, because a business leader, well, a farmer in Africa, they're leading a business. It's not a very profitable business, and it's a business with very low endowments, so to speak, but it's still a business, and there is the leader of the business, right? So, this is a constraint. It tells you what we should focus on. So, mission statements are very important. We used to be Europe's leading business school, and I remember a discussion in the early 90s where we're saying, hey, why should we be just Europe? Why don't we go world? That then allowed us to expand in places like Asia with our campus in Singapore, maybe North America with our, our garage, our, our tech hub in San Francisco. This is part of our mission. It makes sense, all right? So you want to know what those boundaries are. Vision statement. Now, a vision statement, unlike a mission statement, which is to do something, a vision statement is a forecast. It's to be something. It's the end of the road. Many companies will not publish the vision because if you do, you may be revealing too much about your strategic intent. So often it's an internal document, not external. So what is a vision statement? To be the world's most reputable business school. It's to be something. Maybe we think Harvard is more reputable or MIT or London Business School or Wharton, etc. Maybe we're worried about that. We want to be the most reputable business school in the world. Now, do you recognize that a little bit? The most reputable business school. Okay, reputable. That's our cash flow. What kind of price should a reputable business school have? High or low? High. High price, right? Um, what kind of marginal cost? What's our, our marginal cost is the faculty, right? They, they pay us our salary. We're, we're teaching courses, right? So what's our marginal? Oh, high. We get paid a lot of money. Okay, that's good news. Um, what about the units we sell? Well, traditionally low for that high price point, right? And what's our fixed cost structure, high or low? Well, we want reputation. So high. We're going to have a great restaurant. We're going to have great campuses. We're going to have happy faculty. Therefore, our profits are what? High or low? They're low. We're a nonprofit organization with happy fa faculty and really nice restaurants. Now, if we want to expand beyond that, reputation with the world, well, some of the world can't afford our low prices, right? So maybe we'll create a money pump. One part of the organization subsidizes another so that we can go to that lower price point for someone else. That is the vision statement. It's basically something that tells us something about where we want to be one day. Many people's vision statements are not only financial. In fact, the previous statement was on shareholder value. Very few people wake up in the morning and say, hey, I want to work for a company because of the shareholders. Very few people think that. Rather, they think I'm with an organization that wants to, of course, retain earnings and have money, but, but we're here for some greater purpose, right? And I'm going to call that lambda, plus lambda a feel-good factor. So I'm kind of changing the equation a little bit there. So plus lambda. That's like physicists who don't quite explain everything. They'll stick a lambda at the end of their equation. And our lambda is what I'm going to call social or non-financial benefit. Now, that means the units of this equation are kind of mixed. It's kind of a weighted function of something here. But either way, uh, I had a great opportunity to meet the folks at Tata. It's a large Indian company, a uh, big conglomerate, and uh, got to meet their board members in Mumbai. And I asked them at one point, so you have a very strange portfolio. You've got, you know, automobiles, you got telecommunications, you got all these different things, you know, wristwatches and steel. How do you how do you rationalize that portfolio? And they go, "Oh, our portfolio is based on our belief that we want to be a nation builder. Our objective is nation building." And I go, well, "That's interesting. Well, how does that affect your portfolio choices?" And they basically said something to the effect of, "We will not invest in an industry where we have to corrupt a government official. So we will not do that. So we have, because we don't think that's nation building. And I go, well, this is interesting because I've met your salespeople and they are vicious capitalists. They are driven by financing. And they go, yeah, because we believe that if you are excellent at profit maximization, that will generate enough excess cash flow for us to invest in projects in education, in Pune or other areas of the country. So they were very avid about, we do have the cash flow thing, but our purpose is this other objective. Now that's interesting because if you think of AI and machine learning, often it's possible to use technologies in this space to drive the marginal cost to the absolute minimum, the cost of electricity. For example, the publication of a local language reading book. If I can get that to the cost of electricity, 
then I can drop the price point to its theoretic minimum. So if your social mission is to reach the world, then definitely algorithms can help us. Now, the sum of those other things is often called the value statement. So values. So you have mission, vision, values. And what's in the values? The values are your ethics, uh, whether or not you are going to abide by the law, legal considerations, and other forms of purpose. So this is the way most people talk. Now, I've spent a time defining, I've spent a bit of time here defining this objective. Typically, it's about a half a day. If you have to interview people from the salespeople to the board, it might take you two or three weeks to get interviews with everyone, but you definitely want to do that. You want to get interviews of all the people involved in your project, from board members down to salespeople, because you want to hear the variation of their objectives. You're going to spend a day, half a day to a day interviewing, but it might be stretched over a two week period. It's often hard to get a hold of people. My recommendation, try to organize lunches, breakfasts, or dinners with people who are very busy. Usually you can get a lunch opening with anyone. It doesn't matter. The CEO of the company, no problem. There's always a lunch two weeks from now. Um, and what you do is you summarize those objectives. Now, you're going to see words like KPIs, financial, shareholder return, stock prices, all that stuff. And you're going to be thinking to yourself, what does this have to do with machine learning and AI? Well, it's a mirror because at this phase, you're not just going to be getting business objectives. You're then going to translate them to application objectives, visualization objectives. Um, what kind of algorithm are we going to produce? And the tricky part is to get both teams in the room, someone who understands the business objective and then someone who understands the technology objectives. So for example, if you are thinking of launching a chat bot because you think it's a cool application of AI, you need to ask yourself, can the chat bot change my geographic portfolio? Okay, maybe not. What about, does it change my segmentation? Maybe not. Does it change the products or services I can offer? No, not really. Okay, will it change the price that I'm selling at? Because I have a chatbot, can I charge more money? Maybe not. Does it change the marginal cost of the goods that I'm selling? Well, maybe not. Okay, are people actually gonna buy more because I have a chatbot? You know, if it's a fit, no. Well, if it doesn't affect anything, don't do a chatbot. It's that simple. What you need to do is translate the application areas into something you can make money on. I, I'm making a stress on this because so many companies are being hit up by vendors to say, listen, you need to be AI. You need to be at the cutting edge. Start, you need, first you need a data warehouse. You don't have a data warehouse, get a data warehouse and da, 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 da. And all of a sudden they've got a data warehouse, all their data's been the primary keys and all that. And they go, well, how do I make money on this? And because nobody made money on a lot of these data, there are, there's books now being published, data monetization, how do you make money? The point is you need to have the business model first. You have to have the freaking GUI saying with this application, I'll make a hundred million dollars. And you have to have ex an explanation why. Now, it's purely speculative at this point because the product doesn't exist. But if you can't make a linkage between the artificial intelligence or machine learning application to that equation, then maybe don't do it. In other words, many organizations have invested a huge amount in forecasting models. One company that, that we interacted with at NCA, 200 data analysts in this company producing reports. One manager shows up and says, I need a forecast of this. Can you use some automated ARIMA models to forecast this? Okay, great. A report comes out and every month there's a new report. Another manager says, can you give me a report on this? Report. Eventually there's a stack of this many reports that every manager gets in the morning. Uh, and wonder, people are wondering, well, did we ever make money by having a better decision from any of these forecasts? Did we actually get more sales? Were we able to take customers from our competitors and switch them to us? If so, how many and what was the return on investment of that? This is the dilemma of analytics. It can be a sinkhole. You learn potentially nothing. So my recommendation is you do the deliverables. Define them as specifically as you can. You will change them. That's okay. Define them specifically and map them into the equation. Give you my example. I wanted to produce content for the bottom of the pyramid, the world's poorest people. Okay. How do you do that? Well, my interface, it's not an interface, it's a publishing pipeline. 
How do I actually, oh, I have to have them distributed electronically. They have to be converted from Word into PDF. I have to, uh, and you start reverse engineering all the different things required to make this happen. The goal, however, is to make it as cheap as possible as long as it could cover its own costs. So the objective was financial, but how we're actually going to do it also in, in implied that it could be done. Because we use auto translation systems, that affects the global sigma, the first sigma. I can now go to many, many countries, right? It, it also affects the second sigma, the segments. I, I can target academics. I can target children in a village. That would imply different products that I'm going to use. What would those different products be? Again, draft them all out ahead of time so we have a rough idea what this is. It's a very healthy exercise before spending any money, any money. Work with your team, set those objectives, come up with what the deliverables would, would look like if you succeeded at it, and estimate, eh, we're probably going to make money on this. We're probably going to meet our objective. We might cure malaria. We might have a social impact. Okay, let's go for the project. Let's go to the next phase, which is the audit phase. So again, start with objective always. Don't start somewhere else. And the objective is both deliverables and financial and social. All right, that's about it. See you soon. Bye-bye.